so it is in this sense that we have to recognize the value of Sri Aurobindo's work and the mother on earth. Literally human evolution was heading for a massive, gigantic, self-destructive collapse, like a train which has gone off its rails. And their work was to turn it and give it an upward turn and not only to assure the spiritual destiny of humanity through whatever means, through whatever difficulties, but to bring into it a new dimension, a new consciousness which has never been before. If not for this, the circumstances of the earth would have gone through another great bang of the development of the powers of the intellect followed by a gigantic collapse as has happened many times before in the past on earth and on other planets all over the universe. Sri Aurobindo makes pointed reference to Atlantis as one of these great civilizations technologically even greater than what we have attained today entirely destroying itself because the consciousness had not made the breakthrough and the higher spiritual possibility could not be realized. And so, all of this is just to put in context what we are reading here. Something very simply stated, but its import when you begin to dwell on it and what it means is so enormous. In our study of Sri Aurobindo's commentary on the Kena Upanishad, we are at the final chapter of the commentary itself, after which he gives a summary. And this chapter is titled The Transfiguration of the Self and the Gods. And the sense of the transfiguration of the gods we have seen is the psychological powers working in us, Agni, Vayu, Indra, and others, but these three as the most important, working in us, awaken from their narrow, limited, egoistic working. Instead of thinking that it is they in us who have grown, who have attained, who have conquered, they realize that it is the Divine of whom they are a part and a power. And the victory is not their victory, but the victory of the Divine in them. And it is by this awakening that they grow to their own higher possibilities. This transition is a first awakening. But this process itself, Sri Aurobindo describes in three stages. There is the first awakening of this realization and a turning then to want more and more of the divine influence to act, to become passive to its touch, to its action, to become passive instruments in the hands of the divine knowledge, force, consciousness. But then, subsequently, there is the awakening and the opening into the wideness. They realize that it is not just in us that these powers function, they are part of a cosmic functioning, of a cosmic mind, of a cosmic life, of a cosmic matter. This also has been described. And finally now in the paragraph we are reading, the third stage of this, where they not only become aware of this cosmic functioning, but they become aware of the presence which constitutes the cosmic functioning. So this third step is what brings it into unity. Otherwise, our mind joins with cosmic mind, our life joins with cosmic life, our physical body and its senses join with the cosmic matter and senses, but they are still different. 
on a cosmic scale? What is it that unites them? What is it that makes one divinity? Is this third degree of the awakening? So he says in the text, which we only briefly read last time, which we will now further develop. And in fact, in the higher realization, it will not be mind, that is cosmic mind, life, sense, of which even the individual mind, life, sense themselves will be originally aware, but rather that which constitutes them, what makes up this cosmic mind, cosmic life and cosmic sense. It is that which we will become aware of or the powers in us working will awaken to. And by this process of constant visiting and divine touch and influence, the mind of the mind, that is to say, the superconscient knowledge will take possession of the mental understanding and begin to turn all its vision and thinking into luminous stuff and vibration of light of the supermind. So, so far what has been described is this opening into the whole, into the essential, into that of which there are lesser functions. But the list, this step now, an opening to that which is source of it all, something descends from there. And it is this descending movement which is the most important movement in the yoga. The first movement of opening liberates the consciousness, but it is this descending movement which transforms. And in transforming that which was so far human, that which has grown beyond human individual ego into cosmic, but is still part of the cosmic, that undergoes a fundamental transformation, ceases to be what it was, becomes of the nature of the divine. And so this process, the superconscious knowledge takes possession of the mental understanding and begins to turn all its vision and thinking into luminous stuff and vibration of light of the supermind. This process is something which we individually by personal effort cannot do. You will recall mother's very amusing comment when somebody said, Mother, how can we become supramental? She said, Oh, try it. You will not succeed. The, <clears throat> the only thing she says you can do is to prepare in yourself the conditions in which you can be receptive to its action and it can change you into its terms. It's as if, if you asked a monkey or a monkey asked you, how can I become capable of thinking like humans? Well, the fact is they are trying. Mother made this very interesting observation, you know, in some of the things she brought back from Paris and from Japan, things which were of special value, not everything that she could bring, but selections of certain things. Among the things she brought back were paintings and drawings of monkeys. I think they were from Japan, very beautifully made. You see them in Sri Smriti. And mother's comment she made to one of her attendants was, I like to see these pictures of monkeys because they sense this possibility of something beyond them, the possibility of the human mind. And they're struggling, they're aspiring, trying to gain that which they feel is within their reach, but is not actually. But she said, when you look at human beings, they're so self-satisfied, they're so shut up, there is no aspiration in them. So it was that sense of the aspiration, that yearning to go, grow beyond, which was the thing which attracted her. And you see the monkeys have been, especially in the contact with human beings, you see them struggling. And even some of the more developed dogs or cats as human pets, you see them struggling. But they are as if unable to cross beyond a certain line. The change happens not 
because of their effort. It is the effort which creates a condition that allows something else. The mind then to descend and settle and change the very working of their consciousness into its terms. That's when they can awaken to a more human mental experience. And it's the same way in the human consciousness. If we try to think ourselves into supermind, you cannot. Because your very power of thinking is the limiting power. What you can do is to make the mind quiet, open it, enter in relation with that and give yourself to it. Become passive to its touches, to its inspirations. So he says, by this process of constant visiting and divine touch and influence. You see, that's the process of the influence from above. The mind of the mind, that is to say the superconscient knowledge, will take possession of the mental understanding and begin to turn all its vision and thinking. So increasingly as that settles in us, we find ourselves thinking differently in a way that was so impossible to conceive. So far, we have the experience as human beings that you have to think out a thought and then only you can know. So you will see this is the process of conventional education where you are given a problem, you are shown an example and then you have to repeat mechanically a process. And repeating many times you feel now I have the capacity to apply it. But when you come to something which is unusual, not merely process driven, but in, which involves a leap of perception, suddenly this trained monkey mind is surprised, is confused. All of my processes don't work, what do I do now? And at that point the teacher says, think harder. So you think and try and work and struggle and agitate more and more. And you will see the nature of the agitation is in one direction, then another direction, then another direction, always pieces. Or taking pieces and trying to force fit them, dropping, picking another piece, force fit, agitated, restless activity. The very nature of that consciousness is fundamentally different. At, its, at the first step, it is seeing directly. And so the first requirement to be able to see is just to stop this agitation. In a sense, the first requirement to be able to cognize by a higher faculty is to stop the which characterizes your mental thinking function. Stop thinking. Become silent. Become quiet. And this too will happen someday where the teacher says, stop thinking, stop trying too hard, relax and open yourself to receive the intuition, to receive the inspiration. And then suddenly it lights up. And the student to tune in to this experience. Well, we are in that school as adults, <laughs> as sadhakas of the yoga. But if we had been taught this early on in childhood, you can imagine how much more easy the whole journey would have been. Now we have to unlearn a bad habit of thinking too much. And so the first thing which happens is this quieting, this passivity, which Sri Aurobindo has described earlier, and I will reread from there. The repetition of these touches and visitings from the beyond fixes the gods in their upward gaze and expectation. Constant repetition fixes them in a constant passivity. This state of passivity. And then this allows for that to enter and bring its normal functioning into you. And how does he describe that normal functioning? Turn all its vision and thinking into luminous stuff and vibration of light of the supermind. So we have seen there's a shift that takes place, no more this agitated action, but a seeing. But this vision 
can be a seeing as if through a glass darkly as if through a window pane which is darkened you are able to sense forms sense things but not quite see in the twilight in the forest a vague sense oh yes there's something some perception but when the light is fully lit up you see for what it is it is something of this nature of transition that takes place so the power of vision is there and the power of thinking which is of a different grade and this is now filled with luminous stuff and vibration of light literally the experience is as if, as if your mind is flooded with an awareness and a light and in that light all is seen whatever the attention turns to you see it with full revelation you look at the flower you see it alive conscious divine the whole of the divine projecting presenting a front you see its finer nuances you see its deep consciousness you see all the qualities which it blooms out not just the petals but the qualities of consciousness you see the essential quality that it represents that distinguishes this from all the others it is in such a sight that the mother saw the flowers and described their psycho spiritual consciousness the meanings that she gave to the flowers if you observe carefully the meaning she gives to the flower is deeply connected to the color of the flower to the structure of the flower to its medicinal qualities to the cluster in which the flowers are arranged on the branch all of these you will find somehow exemplify represent in form that meaning which she has described but to the inner sight it is the consciousness first the form follows to the outer sight we see ah there is this color so it must be this meaning from the inner sight it is this meaning it is this quality of consciousness therefore the color becomes like this you see the cause and effect is completely reversed so as this shift takes place in our mind and the flooding of light our experience of the world is entirely reversed the cause what was earlier the cause becomes the effect what was earlier the effect is now actually the cause and we see inside out <clears throat> so the superconscious knowledge will take possession of the mental understanding and begin to turn all its vision and thinking now begin to turn he doesn't say turn so there's a whole process gradually happening of which we can only have at first a beginning because it takes time for our mind to acclimatize so one of the things which happens which we will see also shortly in this turn there is also widening while earlier we were used to picking small pieces of thought and then assembling pieces now the very perception sees largely it sees not a piece of a thought but a gigantic all comprehensive embracing thought or idea and then that grows wider until there is a point where as it approaches the fullness of the universality looking at the flower it is not only flower but its place and relation with the plant its place and relation with the earth its place and relation with humanity with evolution its entire past and its entire future to come all is seen in the whole single one idea now for the mind to be habituated to this kind of a large perception takes time because it is so used to being narrow and so gradually this process takes place and so he says begins to turn all its vision and thinking but increasingly it is this substance of light luminous stuff and vibration of light now substance and vibration why does sri aurobindo use both words <clears throat> in the experience first of all there is this clear sense that the light settles in you and it is the light which brings the knowledge there is a clear substantiality a density a tangibility even to the light 
and all else that pours from above. And then in that, there is a particular quality which is its working, the vibration that it brings. The vibration has that particular character of a quality that comes with the light that makes you move, think, feel, perceive differently. And he's pointing to both of these. These fine nuances which Yorubindo captures are of extreme value to the practitioner of the yoga because otherwise we have an experience it is often has a character of overwhelming character and so very quickly we, ca we are only enjoying the overwhelming sense we do not distinguish the finer nuances of the experience when you reach Sri and you find this ah this is what he is pointing to this is what he means those finer aspects coming into your awareness the experience becomes more complete more rich more multifaceted and those aspects begin to grow in you more and more by the very fact that you're aware so luminous stuff and vibration of the light of the super mind now in the initial process there is a descent of light later there is a descent of a greater light and then later of a still greater light just as in the physical world we have the perception of light you switch on the light and well you have a light but you can have a candle light you can have a tube light and then you have the sunlight and you can see what a huge difference it makes somehow when the sun is fully opened in the sky the light is everywhere flooding when in the night you have only the tube light or a single bulb the light comes from a single source and every object has a distinct shadow when you have a candle the shadows are stronger often bigger than the object themselves because the source of light is so small if you sit near the candle and observe your own shadow on the wall it's much bigger and there's a saying in um, Sanskrit which is repeatedly from the yogic tradition that below the candle, below the lantern, is the greatest darkness. If you think about it, the lantern or the candle can light up things. The objects can move, but it cannot light up what is below its own base. Somehow in the very nature of the light in ignorance, the light is always associated with darkness, with shadow with limitation, with ignorance. You cannot separate the two. In Savitri, Sri Aurobindo describes this as, I don't get the exact phrasing, but knowledge has as its the shadow, the darkness. That is, you cannot separate these two anymore. And that's the nature of the mental light. As one opens higher up, you have the sense of the widening of this light and the completeness of the light and the penetration of the light into everything. The sense of shadow begins to fade, it begins to blur. Yes, there is at first still a shadow, but the edges are blurred. Very similar to what happens when you are, the entire sky is lit up. You can't make out very clearly a sharp shadow. But when this grows, you know you are closer to the true light. As an aside, you will, when you visit the meditation hall in the ashram, you will notice something unusual there. The ceiling of the meditation hall is this curved shape. And there's, there's a very good reason for that. When the hall was being made, the mother assigned this particular task, engineering task, to Pavitra. Pavitra was this uh, Frenchman engineer from one of the elite schools of France and uh, so most of the engineering tasks were given to him and here mother's specific guidance was to make the ceiling and the light such that the room will have no shadow anywhere you can think about why you see it's an attempt to recreate in the material domain the reality of the spiritual worlds in the material domain even if you have light all around 
every object still conceals its own interior. You close the box, the outside is lit up, but inside it's dark. But as you shift to the subtle worlds, the inside is equally lit up. You see inside as much as outside. As you go higher up the planes, you begin to see inside out. Your first contact is with the soul of the thing, and then from there, the form of the thing. And so, increasingly the light is from inside out, and the source of the light itself is inside. What? Every object, every form, everything, every atom even. And the result, of course, is no shadow anywhere. It is a world of light. You would even describe it as saying, made of substance of light. Because everything is light and gives off light. So it feels as if it's made of light itself. Light is the substantiality of the reality. And increasingly as you go up, the quality, the vibrational quality of the light also grows, becoming more and more of the nature of the source. Infinite, indivisible, oneness that embraces all. So when Mother made this uh, assignment to Pavitra, it was as if to create a physical space in which something of the higher could be represented. And you see, this is the whole principle of any temple. The symbol itself is somehow to catch a truth of the higher and give it a form in the lower and thereby create a link. <coughs> what Pavitra did was to create an arch of a particular parabolic curve. The light is hidden, concealed inside, and the curve is such that the light equally spreads out across the curve. So when you stand there, you do not see any particular source of light. There's no point source. Light comes from all directions. Effectively, the closest you can get, there's practically no shadow around you. But this is something fundamentally different from inside out. The very substantiality of it is light. So, the superconscious knowledge will take possession of the mental understanding and begin to turn all its vision and thinking into luminous stuff and vibration of light of the supermind, the highest source of the oneness of the divine consciousness. And that is the light which is also, that consciousness is the one which is oneness, infinite, but knowing the full multiplicity in its oneness. And so your mind now filled with this light begins to see everywhere oneness in a perception which is infinite, but which does not blur out the multiplicity of all the tiniest details. The infinitesimals of the infinite are all taken into account in the underlying oneness, in the infinity. And that's the nature of the supermind. And if this is what happens to the mind, so too the sense will be changed by the visiting of the sense, capital lens, by the visitings of the sense behind the sense. And the whole sense view of the universe itself will be altered. So there is the visiting of this higher sense, we have spoken of this before, the divine sense and how the cosmic consciousness perceives. And our sense mind is only a part of that. We have discussed earlier, this is the reason why all of us see the same thing the same color, even though machinery is different in each one, the brain organization is different in each one, yet the perception is the same, because we are part of the universal sense mind. And so as this, visitings of this begin to fill the lower senses, the whole sense view of the universe itself will be altered. In what way? So that the vital, mental, and supramental will become visible to the senses with the physical only as their last, outermost and smallest result. Now you see, just as the mind has been transformed, the senses have to follow. The sequence is very important. First it is the mind, then he speaks of the sense. Why? Because ultimately all our sense perception is taking place in part of the mind that turns to the form. The physical machinery is only a mechanism to connect the outer reality 
to the mind turns to look. You see, the light comes into your uh, retina, is converted into signals, processed in the brain. But even the brain is not seeing, it is mind receiving this in impression from the brain, which is the actual seer. It's the reason why you can close your physical eyes and with the same mind turn and look. Look at forms, conceive of forms, create forms. Because that's the real seer, the real creator of images. But this is still the lesser mind. This mind turning is what creates the perception of senses. When the true mind begins to fill and awaken, its perception in the senses also undergoes an equivalent change. And this is why the sense follows, inevitably. What does it see now? The vital, mental and supramental visible. With the physical only as their last, outermost and smallest result. So suddenly all these higher gradations of consciousness, which constitute the universe, in fact, but to which we are currently blind, all these open out. Why? Currently we are blind to these higher regions because our sense mind is fixated through the physical body only. So unless I open my physical eyes, I cannot see something. But if I close my physical eyes and train the senses to see directly, then not just the physical objects, but I can also sense more than physical objects. And you will notice this often happens when you are making a phone call with somebody at a, a long distance. You are listening and the person is trying to describe something, maybe some feeling, some thought, some experience. And automatically your eyes close. In some part of your consciousness, you as if project trying to feel what they say. And at that point what you perceive is not the physical form. You perceive their emotional state or their thought consciousness and almost as if in an image. Except it's not a physical image, it is an image or a feel of emotion, thought, bundle. And it is overlaid with the image of the person. Now, because this perception is taking place in the inner, in the vital mental layers, you're seeing the reality of the vital mental world and the physical reality is blocked out at best as an overlaid superficial reference. In this location, in this house, this particular person. And sometimes the image is so distinct or the identification is so complete, you even glimpse things of the physical. You see the person vividly. We had a friend who used to visit Pondicherry once a year or so. In those days it was not so easy to travel. This is 25 years ago. And he would, every day when he would sit for meditation, he would project himself in the meditation hall here in the ashram. That was his way of connecting. And it so happened, in preparation for the darshan, they had just changed the curtains, which earlier had been blue and they had made it golden that day and he phoned up and he asked this morning when I sat there and I meditated and put myself in the meditation hall I felt this change the color was no more blue it was golden why is that interesting he was actually perceiving the physical space and the physical arrangement and the physical light because of the degree of that identification but this spontaneously happens especially when we connect to somebody who's dear to us or with whom we have a close um, connection physically. So, although we are projecting in the vital and the mental and see things more there, it completes towards the physical if that is the inclination. But the same thing happens in our physical sight. When we open our eyes, we meet somebody for the first time the physical sight is busy with its physical appearance, but something of the inner sight is seeing behind and you have an impression of the person. You say, ah, this person, oh, he's fine, he's nice, he's comfortable. Somebody else, oh, something is not okay, something uncomfortable there. And in the very first glimpse, that sense catches before even your physical registration has taken place, except we are not mostly conscious on those levels. As we grow conscious, that overlays the physical sight. 
And in all these experiences, we glimpse one level of reality and the other levels are perhaps perceived or connected indirectly. The true sense, the true seeing, as the Divine sees Himself and His universe, is the full range, from the most material to the highest. Everything is part of His perception of Himself. And so as we grow in alignment to His sense, the Divine sense, when we share in His experience of the universe, this has to happen. The vital, mental and supramental will become visible to the senses with the physical only as their last, outermost and smallest result. So, vital, mental and even the supramental. So the vital and mental as we have seen in this example, you can get glimpses of, but it's not a very developed sense. But this opens fully, but much more the supramental, the consciousness of the oneness and the multiplicity of the infinite of the one. And these three, when you directly perceive them, are so much more complete, so much more beautiful, so much more vivid and true, that in relation to them, the physical perception, the physical grade of reality, the physical plane, is felt to be so small, outermost, and last result. We see that in the cosmos things descend top down. The physical events that we see here in matter are the last result of a chain of forces, activities, actions, beings, efforts, complex interplay. And here is the final end. So, he describes it in three ways. With the physical only as their last result. Second word he uses, their outermost result. So, if you see in the person, the body form is the outermost shell of the person. Isn't it? In our own subjective experience, especially as we grow older, you suddenly notice, ah, my body is somehow getting a little more tired, more easily. My body is unable to jump. I feel like jumping. I feel I can jump. I can jump and touch the ceiling. But my body drags me down. And you have a clear sense as one grows older that the inner life has not changed. You feel as young in your heart, even when you are 90, as you were when you were, whatever, 20 or 12. Only the body is this resisting element. And so you realize that your life actually is lived in out, from in to out. The physical layer being the outermost. And so it is in the whole cosmos and everything in the cosmos. As we, we took the example earlier, the flower is first this particular power of the soul, blooming out and as it filters through the mental vital and eventually the physical substance, all these things naturally form around its quality and take up this particular pattern of energy and form, concretizing in its most physical appearance as the last outermost result. So, three words, remember? The physical only as their last outermost and smallest result. This is the interesting part. You actually experience a diminution as one comes into the physical plane. You can observe this when you wake up from sleep, especially if there has been a deep or intense dream experience. It need not be spiritual. It can even be an emotional or a, a mental experience in the dream. And especially if it's a spiritual experience, it's more obvious even. In the dream, there's this intense, overwhelming emotion. And as you wake up from it, you can feel everything, the whole experience is dulling, narrowing, buckening, until at best there's a slight vibration in the body of what you experience there in that state in the subtle body as so intense and overwhelming. The moment you return to the physical body, whoop, narrowing, dulling, flattening. And this is the character of the relation of matter to the higher planes. The higher up you go, the wider 
more comprehensive, more free, more embracing. The lower you come, the more bound, limited, resistant, rigid, less plastic, darkened. Until in matter, suddenly there is this harsh dullness and darkening. Mother refers to this in relation to the soul taking birth. Even when the soul is conscious, not all souls are as conscious, but even when it is a conscious soul making a conscious choice of a particular line of development of experience and of a particular family or environment in which to take birth, it can even preside over the development of the body if it is mature enough, it can be in the environment, preside over the fetus as it develops, infusing its influence on it, molding and shaping it. But at the last stage, when it plunges and then connects into the physical body, there is the identification of the consciousness fixing into the body. Suddenly there is this huge dulling influence and the shock of it is like being hit in a stupor in which everything is forgotten. And that's the nature of the physical body and brain as the vehicle in which the mind has to now inhabit. A very undeveloped brain at that stage. And there's this stupor which comes. If the soul is more developed, more conscious, it tries to make this transition gradually so as not to have this sudden loss. And if it can do that, then often what we find is the sense of consciousness, of its sense of purpose, is there, not fully lost, glimmering, leaking out as if flashing through sometimes between cracks of the personalities, thoughts and emotions, as a, as a direction, and perhaps even through its development of the personality. Or sometimes there are vivid memories of the childhood, even when you were a few months old, which are retained into adulthood. Those were the moments when the consciousness was able to retain its full sense of awakening. But increasingly as it identifies with the now developing layers of personality, those layers tend to conceal, cloud or confuse. The practical result is, I feel somewhere inside me, I know I have something to do, something like that, but I don't know what exactly. And my desire pulls in this way, my thought pulls in that way, the fear of my life and future and security pulls in a different direction, and all the programming of education and society comes to block, conceal, and even distort the whole personality. The light which is inside can only leak out a little bit. Unfortunately, that's the circumstance of the world. But if this inner being is conscious enough, awake enough, it continues to nudge, to push, to break through. As this now grows through this reading of Sri Aurobindo's writings, that clarity begins to dawn in your mind, you begin to understand, suddenly you realize, ah, that's what it was which I used to feel since childhood. And now you give it its rightful place. Where earlier you had the habit of following your desire and ignoring the deeper, finer nuance of the influence warning you, now you realize, oh, always that was right. And I must now consciously turn to listen to it. And so this personality which has largely been concealing begins to awake, align itself through the spirit, to its spiritual aspiration and begin to turn inward to connect to its source. But this happens through often through an external agency, through reading, through listening, through study of literature, of talks, or contact with people in whom you see, oh, they do this, I can also do that. And you catch that movement and begin to turn to rely on the inner. But all of this is unfortunately a slow and laborious process because early on we were the whole movement was distorted. Now this is all to indicate the smallness of the physical domain. From this wider consciousness, as you plunge into matter, there is this narrowing, almost suffocating, dulling, and then loss. 
Mother explains that increasingly, as the evolution grows, this will change. Especially as the spiritual aspect of the evolution develops. In the supramental consciousness and in a supramental body, there will be no more this loss of dullness into matter. Because matter itself will be spiritually awakened. The possibility that matter can be free of its inertia and ignorance in conscience and awakened to a divinization of itself. This possibility even is not conceived of in the existing traditions. It has been glimpsed many times even in these traditions, but they've always glimpsed it as a subtle matter, not the real physical matter itself. So a rainbow body or a light body or a divine body, but always the mind saw it as elsewhere, not here. Sri Aurobindo and the mother affirm not only the possibility, but the inevitability of matter itself awakening and discovering its innate divinity and then revealing it. Now the process may take time, but from the moment where it begins, already things begin to rapidly change. Our body becomes more conscious, more responsive and begins to participate in the aspiration. No more offering a resistance. And with that, the light descending from above can actually enter and penetrate the physical consciousness, which earlier was not possible because it was closed by habit and choice. The moment this small turn takes place of the physical consciousness turning to aspire, everything else becomes possible. And increasingly in the body itself, one begins to receive the action of the higher light. Still, in the overall scheme of things, the physical matter is a narrowing. So far. One day, when matter itself becomes completely transformed, it will know its own infinity and be able to be a vehicle for the infinite to manifest through form. What that means is something inconceivable to us, a glimpse of which only we can have. And I will refer to a couple of experiences which have been described. And you have many such, you will know of, of your own. When my teacher M.P. Pandit was, had the first darshan of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, it was the joint darshan, as he entered the hall and he looked, he said, it was so massive, the presence was so massive. He said, the only thing comparable was the Himalayas. And what is it of the Himalayas that comes to mind? This vastness, this purity, and this gigantic intensity of its presence. The power, the vastness, the purity, and here is a physical form, you can still measure it with a ruler and you will say, oh, it is so many, I don't remember Sri Aurobindo's height as measured by the British when he was put in jail, is part of the record, five feet, six inches, something. Irrelevant. His body underwent a change subsequently, the form of the body changed. But at this point, the physical vehicle, whatever its relative physical shape, what it manifests is no more of the relative physical narrowness but the immensity of matter, in matter, of the Divine. And that is the first glimpse. And there are other such descriptions you will find. Pandiji's sister remembers that when she stepped in and looked, she was simply overwhelmed with light. Everywhere is light. And she said, where is Sri Aurobindo? Where is Mother? There's only this ocean of light. But again, the sense of massive, vast, immense, densely tangible, physically tangible presence. But increasingly, and in degrees, this begins to manifest. So, we are recognizing here the limitation of the physical consciousness as it currently is, against the vital, mental and supramental. But now to this awakening sense, all these are seen. So we reread the sentence. So too, the sense will be changed by the visitings of the divine sense, behind the sense, and the 
whole sense view of the universe itself will be altered so that the vital, mental and supramental will become to the only and the last, outermost and smallest result. Some of this we get a glimpse of, but we have to really understand it deeply, in some of mother's comments. So she would receive a gift. Somebody from such and such a country had sent her a gift. It would come into her hands and it would be not just this physical object, but the intention and quality of consciousness which was, with which the person sent it. Except that the person is not conscious, he is at that point representative of a larger collective consciousness which wants to reach out and connect to her. Is the object is only the last, outermost and smallest point of contact to this whole thing. And this is the reason why you will see repeatedly in her dealings with people, she saw them not merely as the individuals that they were, but often she saw them as representative of a nation, of a civilization or a particular human type in its problems. And she would deal with them in that way. Now this is a deep truth which takes a while to fully appreciate. If, as will happen soon now, but in the end, by the end of this month, in celebration of Aurora's 50th anniversary, you will have people coming from all over the world. Some of them will bring water. There's a whole plan for some ceremony. I don't know the details. But as it happened at the time of the opening of Auroville, they brought soil from their nations. If you look deeply behind that event, it's not just symbolic as we see it in a very reductionist way oh yes they brought soil and put it no the physical symbol is actually carrying behind it the deeper spiritual truth that in that soil being picked up and in these individuals coming it is the consciousness of the whole nation which is being given a focal point in matter and in its coming and settling in the urn it is the world and at a physical level representing the whole world through that focal point which is the smallest physical result but behind it is this whole chain of consciousness and the whole world is literally being drawn together and fixed into this one unity and when it is done with that intention we but even if we are not conscious of it, the very act of doing it by the intention which the mother placed in that whole event, the connection was made. And the inner sight would see all this, would know it. And so what I was trying to get at, by the very fact that a few individuals now will be bringing water, even if they are not conscious, the very fact that this event is about to happen, the collective consciousness of that nation of that culture will sense this and move and project as if a finger or an arm of its consciousness through this material through this water or sand and reach out and participate and actually be present drawn into and merged into this unity when representatives of countries, elected representative, prime ministers, presidents, etc. They meet for an event. You have a G whatever, G10, G20, UN, whatever form it takes. The very fact that they are coming representing their country, the being of the country, the consciousness of the country is using them as a point of support for its intention. Except they are too darkened, too hardened, too crude for something to break through but if even one or two are more conscious it can act to assert its will and this is the reason why as in the world increasingly spiritually conscious people come into positions of leadership the manifestation of the aspiration of the nation soul will take place more and more overtly for now, its action is indirect through 
partial, crude, and very contrary representatives. But as they grow, they become more conscious, this action will be more direct, and the result will be a rapid awakening that will likely to take place, if this little step can be made. So the importance given to these representatives is immense when seen from this perspective. And this kind of a perception will be almost natural to a consciousness so awakened that it sees all these levels and behind the very ordinary physical appearance, all these things which are so massive. In the example of what we call symbolic or ritual magic, it is this truth which is used. Except the magician may be a very ordinary person not understanding the deeper connection. So he is told, all right, you must bring a cloth of this particular color because it represents that force or that deity or that power and place it in this arrangement because this arrangement represents this relationship in the cosmos and so on. So he goes through a ritual and there is a certain result, partial or full. But the person who is inwardly awake, when he takes the cloth, is conscious of the link to what it is he is drawing. When he places it in that arrangement, in his consciousness he holds the cosmos in which this arrangement is being made. And the arrangement itself being done has the character of a cosmic event and the result is enormous, enormously amplified, even massive. And so that's the reason why the people who are so spiritually endowed, often they may make a simple gesture and the gesture will have a huge result and it may be spontaneous they do not need specific knowledge of the magic they feel the connection the link to it and it is done uh, Vasishta Ganapati Muni who was the guru of Kapali Shastriya before he came to Sri Aurobindo he had this extraordinary power there's one of the stories narrated as he was um, entering a village there was a huge fire and many of the huts had caught fire it was too big to be put out and he invoked the Agni Mantra from the Veda and instantly the fire was put out. Now the same mantra you can read and you can repeat. Very unlikely that you will have the power to put out the fire. <clears throat> What's the missing element? The mantra is only the physical point of contact for something which is itself the larger consciousness. When you're conscious of it, you use the physical point of contact as if to turn the liver and the action is made. Uh, Vasishta Ganapati Muni, who was the guru of Kapali Shastriya before he came to Sri Aurobindo, he had this extraordinary power. There's one of the stories narrated as he was um, entering a village, there was a huge fire and many of the huts had caught fire. It was too big to be put out. and he invoked the Agni Mantra from the Veda and instantly the fire was put out. Now the same mantra you can read and you can repeat. Very unlikely that you will have the power to put out the fire. <clears throat> What's the missing element? The mantra is only the physical point of contact for something which is itself the larger consciousness. When you're conscious of it, you use the physical point of contact as if to turn the liver and the action is made. I will share with you something which is of a very intimate character. I don't think I have spoken of it before in public, but it was told to us by Pandiji, who was told of it by uh, Champaklalji, who was Sri Aurobindo's attendant. And uh, Sri Aurobindo was, as you know, he was working to bring down the supramental consciousness into the physical body and fix it in the physical consciousness. And often they had observed when he was sitting on his chair, spontaneously his hand would take on positions of certain mudras, significant gestures. He would look out. And smile at a scene 
and there would be a gesture spontaneously in one particular event <coughs> it was when uh, there was the massacre taking place during in Bengal three days of riots where the Muslims were massacring the Hindus moving experience so one is overwhelmed the news came over the radio that this massacre was going on and on the third day Sri Aurobindo got up with great, great force and holding his fist said with power why don't the Hindus track back And that was it. The next day, the reaction came. There was a reversal. The riots were completely reversed. And uh, at that point, Gandhi went on a fast to ask for the conflict to end. But this simple gesture, simple act, spontaneously taking the mudra, the fist of power, a word, <coughs> a word spoken with force, has a cosmic impact, the value of which we do not recognize in their purely superficial way. Especially when one is embodied on earth who brings the supramental consciousness to fix into matter, the nature of the work, every gesture, every word spoken, everything done is of cosmic consequence. This is not only seen, but begins to become normal to a consciousness thus, which is opened out and united with the cosmos. It's the reason why you will see in the lives of beings who had lived in that consciousness, everything they did, everything they spoke, had a deep import and deep consequence. I recall another incident which was narrated where uh, I don't remember the source of it, but Pandiji had narrated from one of the lives of the saints in India, making a gesture like this towards the sky. Some Himalayan yogi, we don't know the name. And he was asked, what are you doing? He said, there's a plane which is, fall which is falling from the sky. And I'm trying to prevent it. We do, not, we do not realize how much of human life has been protected by these great acts of beings sitting in their caves, perhaps unknown to humanity, but able to perceive and to prevent and act on circumstances in this way, in a consciousness which out of sheer compassion and love served humanity in the tiniest details. Entire civilizational uprisings have been initiated by the dream or the action of one saint or yogi. Sri Aurobindo makes a passing reference to this when he says, when in France there was this great revolution liberty, equality and fraternity. The cause of it, he says, was a yogi in the Himalayas who dreamt of liberty, equality and fraternity. And the result of that dream, dwelling upon it in the cosmos, was on earth, the space most ready to receive that ideal caught. And there was a huge revolution. It's interesting, it's interesting, a gentle movement, a gentle touch, physically symbolized perhaps by nothing and here on the cosmic scale a huge shift a huge change so it is in this sense that we have to recognize the value of Sri Aurobindo's work and the mother on earth literally human evolution was heading for a massive gigantic self-destructive collapse like a train which has gone off its rails and their work was to turn it 
and give it an upward turn and not only to assure the spiritual destiny of humanity through whatever means, through whatever difficulties, but to bring into it a new dimension, a new consciousness which has never been before. If not for this, the circumstances of the earth would have gone through another great bang of the development of the powers of the intellect, followed by a gigantic collapse, as has happened many times before in the past on earth and on other planets all over the universe. Sri Aurobindo makes pointed reference to Atlantis as one of these great civilizations, technologically even greater than what we have attained today, entirely destroying itself because the consciousness had not made the breakthrough and the higher spiritual possibility could not be realized. And so, all of this is just to put in context what we are reading here, something very simply stated, but its import when you begin to dwell on it and what it means is so enormous. So too the sense will be changed by the visitings of the divine sense behind the sense. And the whole sense view of the universe itself will be altered. So the vital, mental and supramental will become visible to the senses with the physical only as their last, outermost result. And finally, we will take this in detail next time. So to the life will become a super life, a conscious movement of the infinite conscious force. It will be impersonal, unlimited by any particular acts and enjoyment, unbound to their results, untroubled by the dualities or the touch of sin and suffering, grandiose, boundless, immortal. And finally, the material world itself will become for these gods a figure of the infinite, luminous and blissful superconscient. You see, in this full awakening of the transformation, what's happening? We are not seeing the divine only there. The whole of the material world is now seen in its divine potential, but a potential increasingly unveiling a figure, a form, a, a rough outline. We will explore this next time in detail. A figure of the infinite, luminous and blissful superconscient. And this is the domain of the play for which we have taken births and for whose fulfillment all our lives are struggling. Not to withdraw, not to abandon, but to realize this divinity and to manifest and to perfect in matter the Satchidananda. We can meditate on this for a few minutes before we leave.